One of the things we have kind of been seeking to see or answer in this series is three questions. Does God see me? Does God care about me? And can I trust him? And so in today's uh, final one, we're using one of my favorite stories. As a matter of fact, uh, one of my oldest, dearest friends is here this morning. When he saw it on the screen, he started laughing. He went, oh, your story, you love this one. So obviously, I'm very predictable to those who know me. But I do love uh, our story today. It's the story of Hosea. And so um, I want to give you some background on the book of Hosea. Now I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I love, love the Old Testament. I love the stories. I love the way it paints the picture of God. I love the way that the new covenant is kind of hinted and hidden in the Old Testament. The one thing I don't like about the Old Testament is I, my, I consider my particular language, not English, but more like Kentucky redneck. And Old Testament names and me go together like oil and water. So uh, if you want to go back and check me, that's fine. You're going to find out sometimes I butchered them. But that's the only downside of my love for the Old Testament is it's the hardest things to pronounce. So uh, anyways, other than that, I love this story today. And uh, our story is about Hosea, one of the minor prophets. Now think about that. You get the title of being a prophet. You get the idea that your name is going to be immortalized as one of the books of the Bible. I mean, very few people other than me get a name like that that is immortalized in the Bible. Let's see some of you questioning. Matthew, Mark, get it? Okay. But Hosea is going to be known for the ages as one of God's prophets. He is the son of a prophet. As a matter of fact, we find out that in 1 Chronicles, he's the son of uh, Bira, Biri or Bira. We've been debating how to say that. I'm going to say Bira. And uh, Bira is mentioned in 1 Chronicles as a prophet. He makes a prophecy against the, uh, the sorcerers of the Canaanites, their wizards. It's a short prophecy, so they include it into a longer prophecy in Isaiah. But he is, a, he is the son of a prophet. So Hosea is the son of a prophet. He's been raised in what we would consider to be a good godly household, right? His dad is someone who hears from God, trying to impart uh, that knowledge to the people. He's obviously imparted it to his son. There's some uh, idea that he's imparted it to his son because of the son's name. Hosea is the same name in, uh, in a different derivation of Joshua. And if you remember a long time ago, we preached on Joshua. And Joshua is the precursor to Jesus' Arabic name. So Joshua, as it would be said in Hebrew, is Yeshua. And Hosea is the root for that. So if you go back in the Bible, you'll see there's a couple of times it uses Hosea for the name of Joshua. It says Hosea, son of Nun. Then later it says Joshua, son of Nun. And the point is this name means salvation, the same as Jesus. And so in essence, the root for Jesus' name is Hosea. The same Hebrew root. And, and you might say it's Jesus is like the namesake of Hosea. And the name meaning salvation. So this godly prophet father has a son who he's raising to be a godly man who will eventually be a prophet of God, whose name literally means salvation. And so there's a little bit about Hosea. So imagine you're growing up in this household, kind of waiting for the, your big day. Your father's been teaching you about the one true God. You've been learning about it. You're waiting for that day that you hear that voice of God in a way that your dad has heard it, and you can give this knowledge to people. And uh, and so that day comes, and it is completely the I didn't sign up for this moment. You see, if you go back, like in his father's case, you get to just come out and tell the wicked people they're wicked. And in in a typical Old Testament prophet lifestyle, that's kind of how it goes. I'm doing fair myself, and you all are doing bad, and here's the prophecy, right? So if you're Hosea, and you're, you're thinking someday that God might make you a prophet like your father, you're thinking this is going to be pretty, you know, pretty amazing. And then this happens. And what happens to Hosea is, is much one of those hold it, God, This isn't the way this should go. This isn't how I wanted this. I didn't sign up for this. Uh, I want to be a prophet, but not not like this. Now, 
I will tell you, if you study the prophets, it's really not that great of a gig anyways, uh, fleshly that is, because they all end up persecuted and harassed and chased and, and uh, assaulted and everything else in between. But Hosea's big moment is, is pretty confusing. Now, most of our, our studies, we got a lot about the person before their moment came. Last week, we covered Paul, and we had all this talk about how Paul was a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Jew of Jews, circumcised on the eighth day. We got all this background. And Hosea, I've given you all the background there is. And we have to go digging to find that. All that we know is Hosea jumps right in to this, I didn't sign up for this moment. This is not how I thought life would go. And as a prophet, instead of being the guy to just speak God's lesson, God decides to live it through Hosea. And I can say it's probably not the choice most of us would have sat down and wrote out on paper. Lord, this is how I'd like to live out your message. But if we get to the end, we see the beauty and glory of it, and we also see how those questions apply to us. So let's, let's just jump right in. Hosea chapter 1, verse 1, this is where we find out who Hosea is. The Lord gave this message to Hosea, the son of Beri, during the years of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, when they were kings of Judah, and Jeroboam, and uh, son of Joash, while king of Israel. That's, that's all the background we get. We had to go look up Beri somewhere else. And then we jump right into Hosea verse one, or chapter 1, verse 2, and here it is. Here's this moment that's totally contrary to everything I would have believed the Lord would have wanted for me as a prophet. I would have had this whole image, you know, living according to the laws of Moses, keeping the feast, doing the sacrifice, all the things the Lord wanted, and then instead he comes with this. Hosea 1-2 says, When the Lord first began to speak to Israel through Hosea, he said to him, Go and marry a prostitute, so that some of her children will be conceived in prostitution. Now, before we read any further, did you catch that line? What he's saying is, Hosea, there's a good chance some of your kids won't be your kids. This will illustrate how Israel has acted like a prostitute by turning against the Lord and worshiping other gods. I mean, if you're Hosea and you've been taught to live a life of holiness, and we've seen from reading the Gospels how when they come out of, of their captivity, how they have developed their Pharisaical Judaism and how they literally disdain certain groups of people. And here you are, Hosea, trying to live this life that you know would be righteous before God, and God comes to you. It's not like you just happen to bump into someone and, and, uh, and made your own choices. God comes to you and says, I want you to marry a prostitute. And there'll be a good chance some of your kids won't even be your own. They'll be from her unfaithfulness. Now, I don't know if a cloud showed up, an audible voice showed up. But, I mean, if you're me, aren't you thinking, I need, I need to really know. You know what I mean? I'd need to really know I was hearing from the Lord because this would be contrary to my plan. Now, I'm not saying we can't redeem people, but literally in the first verse, you're telling me there's a good chance my kids won't even be my kids. What a story, Lord. And so, uh, the, you know, it goes on in Hosea chapter 1. And I'm just going to read it to, parts of it to you. I'm not going to make you read it all on the screen. So it says that Hosea marries Gomer. That's, the, that's her name, Gomer. And, uh, and so she gives him, they, uh, they marry, and she gives him a son. The Lord says, name the son Jezreel, because he will be, uh, he will be a sign to those who committed murder during, uh, at Jezreel during the reign of King Jehu. And then as time goes by, they have another child. And it says soon, it tells us soon Gomer became pregnant again and gave birth to a daughter. And uh, the Lord said to Hosea, name your daughter lo Rumah, which means not loved. Now that, that name should cut you to the bone. Can you imagine? I mean, I, I don't even know what we would name you in the modern to, to hurt as much as that. It, it, that, that would sting like that. Her name means not loved. Ah, oh, I mean, that's harsh. 
And then uh, they go on to, and he tells them why, you know, because the, the sign of these people who have been unfaithful to me. They go on and they have another child. After she's weaned from that one, she gives birth to a second son, and they name him lo Ami. Again, God tells Hosea, name your child lo Ami, and, uh, and this means not my people. Not my people. And what God says is when you name this child lo Ami, not my people, what you're saying is for Israel is not my people, and I am not their God. Do you, I mean, do you hear the pain? Do you hear the message of this? What a thing to be living out as a prophet. What a thing to have been raised in the household of a prophet, to know the teachings of Moses, to have, to have looked at the Torah, to have, to have at least heard it orally, to know the traditions, to hear about Moses on the mountain and the law and the, the tabernacle and to hear about the loss of our kingdom through uh, the, the invasion and the captivity and, and how much we long for the temple and all of this life that we identify with. Now the Lord comes to you and says, marry this unfaithful woman. And when you do, you begin to have children and their names literally are painful. They cut to the bone. I mean, you, you know, uh, you, you think walking in the house, hey, not loved, hey, not my people. Now, that's not how it, that it's, it's their names, but that's what it means. And, and the name means so much more, particularly in their culture. And that's, that's what it would be like. Here comes my kid, not loved and not my people. And possibly not even his people. What a story. What an amazing thing to live out in the presence of the Israelites. You know, uh, many of you know I was adopted at four weeks old. You know, some people joked with me when I was, uh, when I was younger. Maybe they didn't really mean it as a joke. But used to, when there was a child born out of wedlock, there was a derogatory name called for that child. I've had several people remind me that when I was growing up. Fortunately, we've gotten far enough in society we don't say it anymore. Plus, I'm old enough I just don't care if you call me it anyways, right? I'll put it in the long list of everything else I've been called. But... Uh, you know, imagine wearing that name all the time. Imagine having an identity, these poor kids. Imagine what Hosea is going through and all of this so that God could present a message. Now, during this uh, marriage, Gomer does exactly as I guess you'd say predicted. Gomer ends up going back to her old tricks. And she ends up in unfaithfulness. Was that before the kids were born, while the kids are born, after the kids are born? That's never completely defined for us, okay? Uh, there, there's some ambiguity to it, but we know she ends up again in unfaithfulness. And so on top of the names of your children, the thing you've had to do in front of Israel, now at least your immediate community knows your wife isn't even in your house. She's somewhere else in another man's home. I mean, if you're Hosea, this is definitely not how you imagined this going. And, and if you just lived in your human flesh, this would be that moment where you kind of say, thanks, Lord, but I'm going to go this way. But instead, I want you to look with me in Hosea chapter 3 and see how Hosea responds at the instructions of the Lord. Hosea chapter 3, starting in verse 1, tells us what happens. Here's Gomer down the road uh, it, with another man, and it tells us this in Hosea. Then the Lord said to me, Hosea, go and love your wife again. Even though she commits adultery with another lover, this will illustrate that the Lord still loves Israel. Even though the people have turned to other gods and they love to worship them. So I bought her back for 15 pieces of silver and five bushels of barley and a measure of wine. Now, you know, I love to tell you that Jesus is pictured, before I read any further, that Jesus is pictured in all the, through and through in the Old Testament. The bride is redeemed at the price of silver, bread, and wine. Who spills his blood like it's wine and tells us to take wine in remembrance of him? Jesus. Who is the bread of life born in the house of bread? Bethlehem. Jesus. Who was bought for silver? Jesus. Who was betrayed for silver? That is Jesus. You see the, the little, the, the, where it's just beginning to show us a little bit of who this story really is telling us about. 
And then it goes on in verse 3 to say, And then I said to her, You must live in my house for many days and stop your prostitution. During this time you will not have relations with anyone, not even with me. I, I, yes, I left that word out for the room's sake. This shows that Israel will go a long time without a king or a prince and without sacrifices and sacred pillars and priests or idols. So you would say, okay, Lord, you know, I tried it. I did what you said. She's down the road with him. I've had enough. I'm going to kind of move on. As a matter of fact, even according to your own word, as the husband of a wife doing this, I'm allowed to leave. Uh, Old Testament rules only the husband could divorce. By the way, you need to keep that in mind as this story progresses. You, You could be Hosea and say, look, I tried. I did. I'm out. But no, we got Hosea going back and paying to bring back his wife. So we think about Hosea redeeming his wife. Now we start to see that this this story is going to tell us another picture. Also, right here, while we're at it, I want to real quickly tell you something. One of the ministries that we're involved with and we're hoping to increase in the, in the, as the year ends here, your involvement in other ministries like Lexington Rescue and, and some of those others, I want to mention this morning Natalie's sister. Natalie's sister is right over here on Limestone, and they literally extend hope, uh, support, and God's unconditional love to women who have been involved in being sexually exploited. And if you need a great volunteer opportunity, Natalie's sisters would be it. Please look them up. If you're at home, go ahead and look them up now. Here, don't forget that. Uh, lots of jobs you can do. Men, even around the, the property there, they have a, a yard and a lot. They can use some assistance on the property. They had water heater trouble a while back. Uh, there, where they do toiletry bags and snack bags. And so those are some of the easy things you can participate in. But this is reaching out to women that would be in the life of Gomer, showing them that God is redeeming all of us. So I want to mention that while we're talking about this series. But let's get back to Hosea, okay? So here's Hosea redeeming his wife Gomer with, with silver, bread, and wine. It's barley, but it's going to be bread. You know, I did a wedding just yesterday, and I told them during the service that I love doing weddings. I do. I, I, I grew up, my ministry used to say, hey, do weddings. He loved doing funerals. I never got it. I still to this day don't get that. Uh, I love doing weddings. And uh, even if you got a, a, you know, moms that have all these details got to be met, weddings are still fun and joyful. I love them. And uh, yesterday, during the service, I mentioned one of the reasons I love weddings is because it is the most vivid picture of the gospel being played out in real life, in real time. It is like seeing the gospel played out, the groom being Jesus, the bride being us. And so we begin to see that in this story, Jesus as the groom. And let's look at the similarities. Jesus called himself the bridegroom in Matthew. Paul said that the mystery of marriage that, that, was, uh, that he talked about is literally Christ and the church. Jesus ushered in the new covenant, which is like the new betrothal. We find that in Hosea 2 and also in, in 2 Corinthians. And at the point of its completion, we come to Revelations where it says there is the wedding feast of the of the groom, Jesus, and us, the, the bride, the wedding feast in heaven. And so we begin to see in this story that Hosea, who is the namesake of Jesus, is taking the position of the groom, marrying an unfaithful wife who is us, because none of us has been able to live to perfection. And even in the midst of her adultery, even in the midst of her bad actions and wrong choices, what is he doing? He's going to redeem his own bride, bringing her back. And so I want you to think about something because a lot of people have this fixation on the difficulties of the Old Testament. Some of these harsh prophecies of the Lord and, and what seems like do this, do this, do this, or you're out. And, and uh, I've had many people say to me, Mark, you know, I, you, you talk about the grace of the new covenant, but what about all these things in the Old Testament? And my answer is the Old Testament's what helped me discover the New Testament, the, the new covenant, because it was there and we just were missing it. Listen, the, the kids names were not my people and not loved, right? But listen to what it goes on to say. See, if you, if you just stop there, you would go, oh man, this Old Testament's full of this, you know, do it, do it, do it. And if you don't do it right, you're out. But even at the end of chapter one in Hosea, listen to what it says in Hosea 1.10. Yet the time will come 
when Israel will be like the sands on the seashore, too many for you to count. And then at the place, listen, this is God speaking, then at the place where they were told, you are not my people, it will now be said, you are the children of the living God. You see, it's not just in the new covenant that God expresses his love. It is throughout the Bible that God expresses his love. And literally, even though he gives this example to Israel, and even though he's teaching them, even though he wants them to understand faithfulness, even though he's hinting towards the new covenant, and that part of the new covenant is to make the old covenant unlivable, even in that, what is he doing? He is laying the groundwork to remind you that he is always about love. And what does he say? Even in the chapter where he has named the children, not my people, not loved, he ends the chapter by saying, but a day will come. When they will say, you are the children of the living God. In Hosea chapter 2 and and verse 14, the Lord goes on to say, and uh, it's titled, The Lord's Response to an Unfaithful Bride. It goes on to say in, in verse 14, this is God speaking. But then I will win her back again. And I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her there. There's a lot more, but I knew, you know. You just got to get the idea. What is God saying? You see, a lot of people look at the Old Testament and they envision God as just writing everyone off. They miss the mark, they're out. They miss the mark, they're out. They miss the mark, they're out. And what is he saying, even in Hosea? No. Yes, they missed the mark, but what does he say? I will lead her back again. I, God, will do everything I can to redeem my bride, to get her back. And I will take her into the desert and we will have refreshing times. You see, yes, there is this example through Israel to show us, first off, that God is so holy, he is unmatchable, we can never live to the standard, we can never reach perfection, how awe-inspiring he is, how difficult it is, because even today, I told you in my trips to Israel, the gods will say there's always a way around the law, right, Jennifer? Uh, If our God didn't say that, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 times on our trip, he didn't say it all, I mean, over and over again, we'd say, why do they do that? And he'd say, well, there's always a way around the law. The, The Israelites always were believing there's always way around the law. God set it up to say, no, there isn't. The law is concrete. It's perfect. And you can't just have a loophole. You're either guilty or you're not guilty. So that someday he could remove your guilt by himself so that you wouldn't have some weird idea that you could show up to heaven with your own resume, with your own pre-printed past that you made and say, look, here's what I did. You should let me in. I want you to know on that note, when Billy Graham arrived into heaven, He didn't get in by saying anything he had ever done except believe in Jesus. And if you think all the stuff he did on this earth helped him get in there, you are mistaken. You do not understand what this whole Old Testament teaches us about the standard of God, what perfection is, and the only way to have the perfection to get into heaven is to have the identity of the groom. There's nothing you can do, not even preaching to millions in giant stadiums. The standard is unreachable, which is why we need him to come and and take us back and to redeem us. This story is about redemption. All of the gospel, all of the Bible is about redemption. Look at Hosea chapter 14. This is how the book ends. Hosea chapter 14 verses 1 through 4 says this, Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for your sins have brought you down. Bring your confessions and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all of our sins and graciously receive us so that we may offer you our praise. Assyrians cannot save us, nor can our uh, war horses. Never again will we say to the idols we have, uh, that we have made, you are our gods. No, in you alone do the orphans find mercy. And then listen to what the Lord says. Then I will heal you of your unfaithfulness. My love will know no boundaries, for my anger will be gone forever. You see, even in the Old Testament, what was he doing? He was expressing his love. 
He was expressing his desire for you. He was expressing how much you matter to him. Yes, he was setting a standard that was unlivable. As a matter of fact, if your hope is to live it and get in, you will fail. If your hope is to, to put your identity in Jesus and let him be in you and you in him, you will have what you are after. It's that simple. And the Old Testament proves it to us over and over again. And here is the Lord saying, then I will heal your unfaithfulness. You can't heal it. He heals it. And my love will know no bounds. You see, this is, this is, God goes on in that language to say, he'll be like dew. He'll be refreshing to you. That you'll grow up like these beautiful lilies. You'll be like the olive trees with its wide spreading branches. You'll, you'll be as green and perfect as the cedars of Lebanon. Not because of what you can do, but because of what he does. Now, this is the poetry of his day. It's the idea that he changes our unfaithfulness, not us. And so I want us to, to end on uh, Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 through 27. For husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. And he gave up his life for her, not one individual. That's why I hate all these made-up stories that have Jesus marrying someone. Uh, you know, these fictions, these novels, it's junk because it destroys the very picture that God has painted because when he says her, what he means is all of you. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or a wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. I want you to imagine that scene, a pretty woman in the end, if you've seen the movie, where he rides up in the, the limo, hanging out of the top with the flowers, to redeem, to get back the woman whose identity has been changed through the movie and see God as your rescuer. The Bible says he rescues us. I want you to see him riding in to say, I did it. I changed your unfaithfulness. I can cleanse you. I am the one who can bring you back. Nothing you can do. If I ever want to be accused of being a broken record, that's what I want it to be. Mark would never stop saying we couldn't do it. But it was done in Jesus. And, and I know. Because I beat myself up for a great part of my life. For falling short of trying to do it. But he did it. To present us to himself as a spotless bride. Because we couldn't do it. And so here is this moment of Hosea. Did God see him? Oh yeah, I saw him from the beginning. His name was divine. His placement was divine. God saw him. Can, uh, you know, does God care about Hosea? Well, he put him through uh, quite a hurdle, right? But did he care? Yes. As you read through the book of Hosea, what is God doing? He's redeeming the whole family. Does God care? He cares about all of us. If, if he didn't, he wouldn't be redeeming us. And can we trust him? I would say anyone that's willing to sacrifice their life be the house of bread and be broken bread. Be the wine and be poured out. Be the one to, uh, betrayed for silver. Be the one who would give themselves as the offering, the sacrifice for you. Is clearly the, the one we can trust. So this morning, what that says to us, church, is we're going to find ourselves at some point in life. Maybe we've already had it. Maybe it's coming where we kind of say, Lord, this isn't what I signed up for. This isn't how I thought this was going. What's going on? I want you to remind yourself God sees you. God cares about you. And you can trust God. I want you to remember God always has a plan. And he's always at work. And in some way, he is always about redemption. That doesn't mean I can tell you your answer is coming tomorrow. That means I can give you some fairy tale ending, but it means that he is always about redemption. And the ultimate fairy tale ending is that you will live with your groom forever and eternity. And if you're watching or you're in here and you've never made that profession before, you've never just said, Jesus, I believe in who you are, and you've, you've never really received him, today would be the day because you get that redemption. You don't earn that redemption, you get it. Oh, 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 oh,